Hello, and welcome, welcome to God's house. Um, first of all, thank you to all of the people who said prayers for my family as we were quarantining with COVID over the last week and who offered to go pick up groceries and stuff. We did take up uh, one person on that and thoroughly appreciated it. And so thank you for your, for your love and support. Um, I'm not contagious anymore, so uh, hopefully uh, none of you will get anything I had. Um, on to our service today. You know, when theologians talk about the, the suffering and death of Christ, they label those things part of his humiliation, not his exaltation. And of course, that's proper to do. Those weren't exactly things that we would normally think of as glorifying God. Yet, today, we see Christ do something really wonderful, where he takes his suffering and, he, and his death and he, he flips it on his head and he calls it to his Father's glory. He is going to the cross and he says that now God is, is glorified. And so what we see today is that God is so great that he finds glory in dying for us. He finds glory in the cross. And we who follow him then want to also find our glory, not in serving self, but in serving others as he first served us. So that's the, the theme of our service today. Find your glory, excuse me, follow the Savior who finds his glory in the cross. That being said, our service begins on page four of your service folder. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of our Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins, ask our Father for forgiveness, and commit yourselves again to this struggle. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord, our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people, we confess to you, O Lord. Our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves, we confess to you, O Lord. Our love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, we confess to you, O Lord our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us, we confess to you, O Lord.
Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Lord be with you. And let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death we may receive forgiveness of sins and inherit eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 31, where our Lord promises that though his people broke the covenant he made with them, he would take it upon himself to make a new covenant with them, a covenant that would not be like the former covenant where we can break it and and reject it, but a covenant that is one-sided, a covenant that is full of grace, even though, as we know, it would cost him his his own life. Uh, We read from Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You're invited to read with me the verse of the day. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Please stand for the gospel. In the gospel, we see once again how much higher God's thoughts are than our thoughts, because here is where Christ approaches the time where he is going to bear the cross, and he says it is time for him to be glorified. So we shouldn't let the significance of that be lost on us. God finding glory in dying on the cross for sinners. It's our prayer that we now find our glory in following him, in giving up our earthly lives for the sake of service to others, and in doing so, finding eternal life in him. We read, 
Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the son, the, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We sing the hymn of the day. Peace be to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Have you ever stopped and just pondered for a while what that was like? Like, what was it like for Jesus before Jesus became the Jesus that you know as Jesus? Before he made himself flesh and so made his dwelling among us? To put it mildly, it must have been pretty cool. Like, unbelievably cool, inconceivably amazing. There are a few places in the Bible where the biblical authors try to capture the glory of God because they're given a vision of it. And when they do that, when they, when they describe the glory of God, which Jesus says is the glory he shared with his Father from all eternity, it is just kind of an otherworldly thing. Listen, for example, to how Ezekiel describes this glory. He says, above the expanse, and I'm trimming this down. I wish I could read the whole longer thing because it's just amazing. But above the expanse, what looked like, uh, excuse me, was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. Then later on, John, who writes the gospel lesson for today, John obviously has his revelation, and he catches a a glimpse of God's glory too. And, and he similarly descri- describes it in a way that seems otherworldly, is maybe the best way of putting it. Listen to what he says. This is from Revelation. He says, There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Day and night, the four living creatures that surround the throne never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So it's inconceivable. But it's not really how you know Jesus. Right? Like when you hear the the word Jesus, this is not what you think of. Instead, what you and I typically think of when we hear the word Jesus, when we think of Jesus, is the Jesus of the hymn, O Jesus, so meek, O Jesus, so mild, right? Like the Jesus we think about looks like a guy, kind of a nice-looking guy. Kind of curly hair, gentle, peaceable. Right? The Jesus we know is the Jesus who began his dwelling among us by dwelling in the womb of a peasant girl. And then, when it was time for the Jesus that we know to break free of that little prison, he came out to be laid in a manger. Because, on that particular night in Bethlehem, there wasn't any room available for the Son of God. Sorry. Right? And then if you keep following Jesus throughout his life, it would be only a few months later that this little baby Jesus is whisked away by his father to go down to a pagan land to escape a pagan king in the land of God. And on and on it it goes from there. Jesus wasn't just 
hanging out in these kind of lowly places in his childhood either, right? This is how he rolled as he made his dwelling among us. Zacchaeus, I must come to your house today, he said to the chief tax collector. Your house, Zacchaeus. And Matthew, who had just been called by Jesus, who is also known as Levi, records that while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house after he had just called him, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. Why? For there were many of those types who followed him. And when one guy comes up and he's kind of amazed by Jesus and he says, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, what does Jesus say? He says, foxes have holes and, holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And this is before he begins his passion. Right? To continue to follow Jesus throughout his life means to then follow him into this sham trial where this one who has spent his whole life welcoming the, those who are welcomed by no one else, healing those whom no one else can heal, loving those whom no one else loves, this man is accused of crimes worthy of death. It means following Jesus throughout his life means then hearing him not only accused of these crimes, but then seeing him paraded into the palace of a sniveling, spineless, self-preserving Roman governor who knows he's done nothing worthy of death, but who condemns him anyway. And it means then following him to a Roman whipping post, to a skull-shaped hill, and to a cross. And here is why. It is all because it was in saving you and in forgiving the likes of me and in sparing us the pain that he suffered on that cross that our Lord Jesus Christ found his glory. Now my heart is troubled, he says in the gospel lesson. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. No, he says. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Yes, though Jesus had this glory that is incomparable to anything that we can conceive of, he leaves it all behind for the glory of the cross. Because it was on a cross that he would save you and me. What a friend you have in Jesus, right? What a friend we have in Jesus. A friend like no other who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases by taking them on it on himself and calling that his glory. It's worthy of pondering for all eternity. And so I don't want to pass over it too quickly. Yet realize also that in Jesus, we have this incredible friend, but he's not just your friend. Soak up the friendship of the God who gave up that glory for a cross and called that his glory. Soak it up, but then worship the one who did that too. Right? Because in Jesus, you don't just have a friend, you also have a Lord and a God. You have the one you have been now called to serve. You have the one to follow. And so I'm sharing this incredible juxtaposition of the glory of Christ in eternity with his complete lack of glory, at least from a human perspective, that he had while he was among us in order to magnify his love. But, his love. but I don't share it just to magnify his, his love. I also share it as a reminder of, to, of, of the life to which you've now been called. See, our Lord, our Lord says in the gospel, not only glorify your name, Father, 
as he's about to go to the cross. But he also says, whoever serves me must follow me. And he says, where I am, my servant also will be. So as you contemplate the places in which the Savior dwelled, as you, as you contemplate the company he kept, as you ponder the ways in which Jesus spent his days, it's good for us to ask ourselves this question, how well do I, as Christ's servant, actually follow Christ? Like, am I doing what he did with his life? Obviously, I'm not the savior of the world. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But am I spending my days seeking the welfare of others above myself? Am I willing to humble myself to become nothing in order that I may, as Christ lifted up others, lift up others? Am I finding my glory in service? Or am I finding my glory in self-service? Now, obviously, I can't answer any of those questions for you, but what I can do is tell you that following the Savior isn't natural. It's not natural for anybody. And I, I know that from personal experience. Right? You can look the part pretty easy. You can look like a servant of Christ pretty easily, but... But to live a life of true service, a life that has service in the vein of the Savior's service, that's far easier said than done. Like, again, I, I just apply it to myself, and I, and I think, you know, it's easy for it to look like my whole life as a, as a Christian pastor is all about service to others, right? But recently I've kind of become more and more aware of of how often even the work of a pastor can very much be less about serving others and bringing glory to Christ than it can be about accomplishing one's own goals. Like only only recently have I realized that, that ministry, a word that means service, can't be about building an organization. Right? That's not what ministry is. Because when it's about building an organization, then it's kind of about my glory. When it's about building up the organization, it's about self-service. And so ministry instead ought to be about spending unhurried time simply being a shepherd, which means spending time with sheep, with all of their idiosyncrasies, with, with all of their quirks and sins, loving them as Christ loved them, applying the Word of God to them, whether it is efficient or not, whether it furthers the goals that that man would hold in our hearts, right? Building a large organization or not. Anyway, I I hope you kind of get my drift here because what I'm not trying to do is, is somehow confess some personal deep, dark sin to you. Instead, I just want you to ask if you or ever like me, so that you can confess your sin to and be forgiven. Like, I'm urging you today to ask yourself, where do you find your life? Like, where are you investing your life? Are you, are you investing your life in pursuits that bring you glory? Or do you invest your life in pursuits that truly serve others and bring glory to Christ? Like if you have, if you're still working and you have a career, is your career, is it about having success so that you can feel good about yourself? Or is it really about serving others, whether or not that brings you any recognition or or anything like that? Or if you're retired, is your retirement about having more time and energy to serve people, or is it about finally being able to do what you want with life and live life your way? Or even if you volunteer and you you spend time in that seemingly selfless way, is that really about serving other people? 
Or can it sometimes be about making yourself feel good? What we need to do is ask ourselves, am I holding, am I trying to hold on to the seed of my life so that it can grow into something beautiful that I'm proud of? Or am I willing to cast my life into the dirt as Jesus talked about in the gospel with that seed, right? Am I willing to cast my life into the dirt that God might use my service in the dirt of this world to bring him to others and with him to bring them life. Again, I can't answer any of those questions for you because they're all a matter of attitude. And of course, there's not a simple answer to any of those questions either because as sinner saints, our motivation is never entirely evil and it's never entirely good either. We're always mixed creatures and and the good we want to do, we don't do quite like we should do. And the evil we don't want to do, we keep on letting that infiltrate even our best days. But I want you to ask those questions, not only that you might once again realize and turn from your sin, but also so that you might, realizing your sin, you might once again be able to turn back to the Savior and rejoice in this one who refused to be selfish, who refused to make everything just about himself, and who instead found his glory in saving us. Amen. And now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory both now and in eternity. Amen. For our confession of faith today, we use the Nicene Creed. It's on page 9 of your service folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Please remain standing for prayer. We pray. Lord Jesus, you are the author and perfecter of our faith. Obeying your Father's will, you endured the cross and scorned its shame. Now you sit at the right hand of the throne of God, governing all things. Lord, we confess that it was for us and for our salvation that you came to this world to suffer and die. You bore our guilt. You endured our punishment. You experienced the wrath of God in our place. For your unselfish sacrifice on our behalf, help us to show our gratitude to you in everything we think, say, and do. 
As we walk through life, keep us from becoming entangled by sin. Remove all obstacles and stumbling blocks and keep us from falling or going astray. Help us run with perseverance the race that you have marked out for us. And when that way involves pain, suffering, or persecution, help us view these things as evidence of your loving discipline intended to draw us closer to you. Heavenly Father, we also come before you today on behalf of Don Betcher, whose dear friend, Sandra Kane, you, Sandra Kay, you have recently taken to be with yourself by death. We ask that you would comfort him and the rest of her family in their sorrow with the sure promises that you are with them always, that you give them strength to endure, that all who fall asleep with faith in you live with you, and that one day all those who have fallen asleep in you will rise to live forever in your new creation. Lord God, we also ask that you'd hear us as we bring you our private petitions. Now, Lord, we ask that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our service continues with the celebration of God's love for us and the celebration of Holy Communion we pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, because you have brought us from death to life. With humble and repentant hearts, we praise and thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who became our substitute under your holy law, who destroyed the works of the devil by his perfect obedience to your will who willingly carried a cross to pay the debt of the world's sin, who lives and reigns to give us life. Through his body and blood once given and poured out for us, forgive our sins and strengthen us for our journey heavenward. Unite us to our crucified and risen Lord that we may believe in him, confess him, call on his name, and finally be delivered from this world to the feast of the Lamb, This kingdom has no end. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. This time, all those who are one with us in the faith, who have confessed their sins and desire the Lord's forgiveness in the bread and wine and body and blood of the Savior are invited to come forward to receive it. Uh, We'll begin on this side of the church as soon as I grab my mask and sanitize my hands.
take and eat. This is the body of Christ, which was given into death for you. And take and drink. This is the blood of Christ, which was shed on the cross for you. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Then take and drink. This is the true blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you the blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. 
blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed on the cross for you. Please stand. And now may this true body and blood of Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith until the day when your faith becomes perfect sight. Depart in God's peace because your sins are forgiven and life is yours in Christ. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we sing our final hymn.
Welcome to God's house. I don't have any uh, special announcements for you other than to please note that on uh, March 28th, we will be having our uh, next call meeting for an upper grade teacher and principal, and that will be held after uh, the late service. That being said, have a wonderful week in the Lord, and uh, I'll usher you out. And happy St. Patty's Day. <laughs>